Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Among the four sources of the right or of duty, the four virtues that, that Cicero discusses, in book one of On Duties, we find temperance being treated last, but this doesn't mean that it's actually the least important. As a matter of fact, as we're going to see, Cicero treats temperance in a certain sense as undergirding all of the virtues, as involved in each and every of them, and that makes sense. The virtues should, in fact, harmonize with each other rather than contend. Uh, so what does Cicero tell us about temperance? Like each of the other virtues, it comes out of something that is implanted in our very human nature, a drive or an inclination, if you like, something that is characteristic to us as human beings. And we don't have to worry about whether it's only characteristic to us as human beings. It is especially characteristic to us as human beings. And so he talks about this as a sense or a way of perceiving. We he uses the word, uh, the verb sintere, right? We, we perceive, we, we sense. What do we sense? We sense order, ordo. We sense what is befitting, what, what actually belongs or doesn't belong or what harmonizes well in, in Latin that is quid sit quo deceat, right? Uh, literally, what it is that is best or, or is appropriate in those circumstances. He goes on and he tells us that we also are the, the only animal that really has a sense for, for beauty, for pulchritudinem, uh, for attractiveness, uh, venestatum, and for appropriateness, for what, again, fits, what, what is uh, uh, the right thing at the right time. And that is uh, uh, convenientium in, in this. So this gives us a, a different orientation towards the world, towards other people, towards things, and even towards ourselves than other animal life has, at least according to, to the Stoics, going with what they understand about animals at their own time. In chapter 4 and also in chapter 5, he stresses that it involves both bodily and mental or psychical aspects of ourselves. We can think about orderliness or beauty, not only in terms of how we speak, you know, eloquence, or in terms of uh, how, we, how we move, you know, or how our body is laid out, or whether I tie my tie correctly. We can also, even more importantly, think about it in terms of our own mental acts, our dispositions, the ways in which we choose and therefore behave, the ways in which we understand the world, the ways in which we perceive things, the conclusions we you know, labor our way to or, or jump to. All of those fall in there. He also includes certain externals as well. So we're going to see uh, much later in the work that Cicero will devote some discussion to how you decorate and build your house. And we might think about this as applying not just to our house or how we arrange our books on the bookshelf, but, you know, our cars or, uh, you know, the, the clothing that we're wearing or our desk space at work or any of these sorts of things. They can all fall under this, this basic conception 
of temperance involving all of these different aspects. Um, the other thing that he tells us, and this is in chapter 5, is that um, this leads us to value and to, to strive for, he says, orderly, orderliness and moderation of everything that is said and done, wherein consist temperance and self-control, modestia and temperancia. Um, so it really extends to every single thing that we're, we're involved with. All of it can be done in a moderate or temperate or consistent way, or it can be done in ways that are out of harmony with that. And, and I'll pause here for a moment just to give an example. When you think about um, tidying up your place, why do you, in fact, pick the clothes up off the floor and put them into a basket or a hamper to take down to do your laundry? Why do you clean up the kitchen, or perhaps you don't, <laughs> when, when you, you eat, you know, or put things into the, the uh, sink or the dishwasher, what have you, right? Uh, why is it important when you uh, uh, are working in an office to actually use the trash receptacles and to not keep your desk a complete mess? Is it, is it because you're only, you know, doing it because of the social pressure of other people looking at you as being a slob if you don't? Or is it because that there's something within you that recognizes that this is not the best way, that it's better to have some sort of orderliness? Can you go, uh, on the other hand, can you go too far and have a, you might say, an intemperate temperance? That's certainly possible as well. There's going to be sort of a, a balancing act, bringing order, bringing decorum, bringing appropriateness into our existence and not just our own existence, but our shared existence with others. All right, back to temperance. So uh, another key aspect of temperance, and here we have to jump far ahead into chapter 27, is that temperance is in fact required for all of the other virtues to, to function. Uh, and, and Cicero gives you a lot of discussions. He says, all right, we're going to discuss the next remaining division of, of moral rectitude. That is in the one, the one in which we find considerateness and self-control. Again, temperancia et modestia being translated slightly different there. And he says, it embraces also temperance in the sense of, uh, here we go, um, the, 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 the complete subjection of all the passions and moderation in all things. And he says, under this head is further included what in Latin may be called decorum. In the Greek is called the prepon. And he says, this is its essential nature. It is inseparable from moral goodness. For what is proper is morally right. What is morally right is proper. He says, this is uh, at the core of, of wisdom. To employ reason and speech rationally, to do so with careful consideration, whatever one does, and in everything to discern the truth, that is the proper, that is what is appropriate to us. To be mistaken, on the other hand, to miss the truth, to fall into the air, to be led astray, that is as improper as to be deranged and lose one's mind. And all things just are proper, all things unjust, like all things immoral, are improper. So he's saying... Wisdom, justice, and temperance are all interconnected with each other. He also says this about, about courage. He says the relation of propriety uh, to, to fortitude, to courage, is similar. What is done in a courageous spirit seems becoming to a person improper. What is done in a contrary fashion is at once immoral and improper. Now, why is it so connected? Why is it so closely bound up, as he says, with the other cardinal virtues? He says, there's a certain element of propriety perceptible in every act of moral rectitude. And this can be separated from virtue theoretically better than it can be practically, which means that if we are actually trying to live as courageous, as just, as wise people, we cannot afford to not pay attention to appropriateness, to what is befitting within particular circumstances. So this is what he calls a general sort of propriety, which is found in moral goodness as a whole. Uh, setting that aside then, what is 
temperance as a specific virtue, as one of the cardinal virtues. He says it can be defined as what harmonizes with human superiority, excellentia, over the rest of animal life. How are we different from the other animals? Now, a lot of philosophers would say, oh, the possession of a rational mind, wisdom is how we differ. Cicero is saying, well, that's true, but also temperance, also moderation. So he, he says, propriety um, uh, differs, is how we differ. They define the special type of propriety, which is subordinate to the general notion. It is what harmonizes with nature. And what is that going to mean for us? He, he gives us a lot of examples here. And he actually includes in the course of this discussion, the famous Stoic four characters, which I'm not going to discuss here because we've already got a separate discussion of that available elsewhere. What is more important here is a discussion that takes place at the end of chapter 28 and the beginning of chapter 29. One which is going to frame things in terms of two, you might say, functions or dimensions of human existence. Appetite or desire or choice, however you want to frame it. He, he says in Greek, it's horme, which has a special technical meaning for the Stoics, a very broad meaning, uh, and reason or rationality. What is the relationship between these? He says, the essential activity of the spirit is twofold. One force is appetite, which impels a person this way and that. The other is reason. What does reason do? It teaches, explains what should be done and what should be left undone. When things are going properly, he says, reason commands, appetite obeys. That's not always the case, though, is it? And when we are intemperate, it's a case of appetite ruling where reason should be the one calling the shots. So he says, every action ought to be free from undue haste or carelessness. Why are we hasty? Why are we careless? Because appetite impels us. Reason would say, no, no, pay attention to what you're doing. Neither ought we to do anything for which we cannot assign a reasonable motive. He says, the appetites, moreover, must be made to obey the rules of reason. And notice he says two important things here. Neither should they be allowed to run ahead right? We shouldn't allow the appetites to be excessive and to push us into things that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, not, not a rational reason, but, but for whatever motive uh, we, we choose. He also says that the appetite should not be allowed to lag behind. He says, not from uh, listlessness or indolence, right? So there may be cases where the right thing to do, according to reason, is for us to feel a certain way. And, and Cicero would say, you know, it, we may not be successful in this, but, but reason tells the appetites, you ought to be desiring this. And if we do that often enough, we, we sometimes find ourselves able to do this. So he says, when the appetites overstep their bounds uh, and galloping away, whether in desire or aversion or not held in hand with reason, they overleap all bound or measure. They result in a lack of temperance, intemperance, in fact. And this can be in terms of food. This can be in terms of how we furnish our, our houses. This can be in terms of seeking out Facebook likes. This can be in terms of what it is that we, we say. So temperance itself requires a uh, effort to make reason be in charge. Reason is at the core of every one of the virtues for the Stoics. And we see that it plays an, an especially pronounced role here in this entire realm of what we call the virtue of temperance.